blasting, billowing, bursting forth with the power of 10 billion butterfly sneezes. I'm Tom Bain, and this is Wine, Money, and Song. If you're interested in wines and wanting to find out the best values, please subscribe. So we finished off the last episode with the 1980 vintage, which blew. And you're going to see that in the next 20 years, there'll be a lot of uh, vintages that blow also. Uh, so onward from 80 to 81. In 81, there were some good compact wines made. Uh, they were kind of in the middle and, and some were mediocre, but... There were some good wines. Gruyere La Rose, I remember, was very good. Uh, the first growths, uh, Lafitte, I liked more in 81 than I liked in 83. Uh, was it a great Lafitte? No, but uh, some decent wines. Then we went on to 1982, which was the <clears throat> first of the modern Bordeaux vintages where all the new winemaking techniques uh, that was imported mainly from California. Stainless steel tanks, uh, uh, controlled uh, fermentation temperatures, and more hygiene. And the 82 vintage was a big harvest. It was a huge harvest. And the wines, in 1983, was the f I, I was in Bordeaux and I tried the 82s at a barrel. And uh, the wines were amazingly fresh and fruity and lush right out of the barrel. And the noses were very fragrant and, and uh, really filled up the room. And a lot of people thought these wines would not age well. But as of today, a lot of these wines are still going strong. And it was truly a great vintage. It, it was a benchmark vintage and especially for the new style of Bordeaux. And there were a lot of critics of these vintage in the beginning, but they were proven wrong. And uh, I bought a good amount of them, and uh, it's a very, very classic vintage. Then we went on to 1983. Uh, some good wines made in 83. Um, the area of Margot proved to be uh, very outstanding, and a lot of the 83 Margots uh, in the Appalachian were better than the 82s. So that's something. Uh, then we went to 1984, and that really blew too. And I remember uh, being in the business uh, selling 1984 Bordeaux. We had to give them away again. You know, and that's the character of uh, the wine business, wine importing business. We had contracts we had to buy every vintage. Whether they were good, bad, or indifferent. But when we had great vintages, we were guaranteed in getting a certain amount and having a reserve to buy even more. So when you bought the 84s, even though they blew, uh, uh, you got a lot of the 82s because you've been buying the poor vintages. So that's the wine business. So uh, on to 1985 which I consider to be one of the most unheralded, uh, of really outstanding vintage that sort of went under everyone's view. Uh, the wines are very classic, very elegant, very elegant, and, and, and really put together well. And uh, the first growths weren't great, they were very good, except for Obreon. And Obreon made one of the best Obreons they ever made. Incredible wine. Incredible wine. And the 1985 Leo Villascas too. Great wine. Great wine. And if you have a chance to drink any of the 85s, they're still good. They're very balanced. Not overly tannic, but, but really Bordeaux style, Claret style. Uh, then we went to 1986 which was kind of the opposite, where it was a really tannic vintage, really brutally tannic. I remember tasting the wines in 87, uh, and I was with my boss in Bordeaux, and I said, whoa, these wines remind me of Barolo. You know, they're, they're really, and I go, are these wines going to be able to make it? Uh, you know, they're going to have enough fruit, but uh, on the left bank, some outstanding wines were made. Mouton and Margot were both very tannic. Uh, 
the Mutons coming around. I don't know if the Margot will ever come around. Very, very tannic. And the right bank, I would stay away from. Then we went on to 1987, and that blew. Really very poor, no ripeness. We went to 1988, and that was an average year, but you got some nice round uh, and round wines that had some texture, some feel, and you had to be very choosy in that vintage. But there were some nice wines, but at this juncture, uh, you should probably let them pass. Uh, then we come to 89 and 90, and I want to bunch those together because they were two back-to-back -back vintages of very, very hot harvests, very, very warm. And I remember in 89... Uh, Right around in December, uh, the New York Times on the front page said the 1989 uh, Bordeaux vintage is going to be the best vintage of the century. And it just didn't play out that way. And what happened with the 89s is uh, some of the wines uh, were picked too late. Uh, they didn't have balance and uh Overproduction also, and uh, there's some great wines made in '89. Uh, Obreon might be one of the greatest uh, Obreons ever made. Lenition Obreon, Petrus, and the Right Bank wines. Uh, some of the Right Bank wines did really well. Uh, and, and, and you have to remember, it was a hot year. So 1990 was another hot year. But I think the winemakers learned a lot from the 1989 hot vintage. And they picked earlier, and uh, all over Bordeaux, the wines were very consistent, very fruity, uh, and and just delicious. And um, I rate the 90s uh, very, very well because everyone made good wines. And that's rare. That's rare in Bordeaux. Uh, so even to this day... Uh, Great ripeness, uh, and there's some great wines made in 90. Margot, Montrose, uh, some people think L'Angelus is great, but you can go, go right over things. And uh, the one thing about 89s and 90s, with the exception of Aubryon in 89, uh, the first growths really didn't do well in 89. And in 1990, yeah, Margot was good. Uh, Lafitte was good. Uh, but they underperformed a little bit in these hot vintages. And you don't see that anymore now. So we go on to 91. And I remember 1991, I read there was a killing frost in the spring. And killing frost, some of the vineyards lost 80% of their crop in the spring. So there was very little out there, and there's no interest in these wines. But I do remember having Montrose 91. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. But 91's no. Then we went on to 1982. That blew. And 1993. 92 and 93, that blew too. So this is what I'm talking about, that you have three or four vintages in a row that were really bad. So that leads us up to the 1994. And the 1994, everyone wanted a good vintage because the last few were really disastrous. So the wines came in and there was some rain at the harvest, but everyone thought this was going to be a vintage. But the wines are generally very lean, unripe, with some exceptions with some exceptions. Leoville Barton is very good. Uh, Aubryon was good. Uh, but I've had wines like La Vangile, no good. No, just lean, herbaceous. Uh, and, and I bought some of those wines because they were so cheap, but there's very few of them that you really want to have in your cellar. Onward to 1995. Now, just so you know, I bought 83 cases of classified 1995 uh, Bordeaux. And there was a number of reasons. I liked the vintage. Uh, when I had them at a barrel, uh, I picked the top wines like Pichon Lalande, Du Coubeau Caillou, uh, Calen Segur, what am I leaving out? You know, I bought like five cases of each of them because they were so cheap. And I knew the prices were going to be going up a lot in the next few months. So to me, it was an investment, but I picked the best wines out. But looking back, 
uh, in the rear view mirror, some of the wines lacked ripeness, especially along the left bank. And the wines of aging, they're still very young. And these wines are 30 years old and they're still young. The colors are still red. Uh, but some of the left bank wines, the Cabernet wines, have a spot of, of this little hole. It needs more stuffing. Uh, but there's some good wines there too. Be very choosy. Pick the best wines and they're excellent. But some of the other wines are not. And I like the right bank more than the left bank. Onward to 1996. And it was a great vintage for Cabernet in the left bank. Very tannic, very classic. And I know Parker loved the left bank wines, and uh, he was right. It's hard to do wrong on the left bank. Uh, the right bank, no. Did not like the right bank wines. Merlot suffered. So onward to 1977. It was okay, but uh, it, it was very, very quick aging and nothing of great interest. Then the 1998... Uh, this is a vintage that kind of went by people very quickly. Uh, the right bank and the Grave wines were outstanding, were outstanding. And they were classic, but they were mixed on the left bank. But first growths did very well in the left bank. But after that, the quality dropped very, very quickly in 1998. Uh, I remember when I was in uh, Pomerol, and we were in Christian Buex's office and we were tasting 2000s and we were talking about it. And then he said to me, he says, you know, the 1998s, he says, people are not talking about them. They're talking about the 2000s, but those 98s are incredible. He said, at Petrus, we picked the last day. And then the next day when we were done, we went to the beach. He says, those wines are incredible. People should not overlook them. So enough said. Uh, Look into those wines, Grave, uh, <clears throat> O'Brien's great in 98, uh, and, and all the first growths are very, very good, Lafitte included. Uh, 1999 was light and easy to drink, uh, and I remember I had a tasting in my office, 20 of them. None of them were great, but they were all nice, Bordeaux, and uh, short to medium term wines. So we're going to come out of the box uh, with 2000 next episode.